You're listening to the Revision Path Podcast, a weekly showcase of the world's black graphic designers, web designers, and web developers. Through in-depth interviews, you'll learn about their work, their goals, and what inspires them as creative individuals. Here's your host, Maurice Cherry. Welcome again to another episode of the Revision Path Podcast. I'm Maurice Cherry, and before we get to this week's interview, let's talk about our awesome sponsors. First, there's MailChimp, our favorite email service provider. We use it for our monthly newsletters, for our weekly newsletters to sponsors, and it's just so easy to use. Uh, With drag-and-drop templates and helpful resource guides, anyone can get started with email marketing. Just visit MailChimp.com and sign up today for a free account. This episode is sponsored by 70KFT. 70KFT is a brand communications agency that develops and deploys marketing strategies through three practice areas, design, digital marketing, and public relations. Check them out at 70kft.com and check them out on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash 70kft. This week I'll be at Weapons of Mass Creation Fest in Cleveland, Ohio. I'll be on a panel discussing race and culture in the creative community. Uh, The panel is going to be on Saturday, so you can find out more information, including single day tickets, at wmcfest.com. Now let's get to this week's interview. I talked with Jacinda Walker, a design strategist in Columbus, Ohio. Here we go. All right, so tell us who you are and what you do. Well, my name is Jacinda Walker. I'm a design strategist. I'm currently in Columbus, Ohio, and I've been in the industry now for about 20 years. 20 years. Tell us exactly what is a design strategist. What do design strategists do? Design strategists are based in ideation. I primarily work with clients from nonprofit, entrepreneurial, lots of entrepreneur clients. Also work for municipalities, governments, education systems. I look at their design that they're currently doing and I look at ways to make it better, make it more cost effective, meet the message, meet the market. And we just look at the design from not just the doing the work part, but the producing it and making sure that it's doing what we want it to do. And now you say that you've got 20 years in the business. Tell me about your first, I guess, design job or your first sort of break into design. How was it and what did you learn from that? It was really a great opportunity. I, my first design job, I was a design intern at Hickok Engineering. It's a small company in Cleveland on the east side, and they create a lot of the parts for Ford. So when I heard that they were connected to Ford, I was already nervous and overthinking everything, as usual. And I got the position because uh, one of my first mentors, she knew another guy who knew another guy and said, hey, I know this girl who's um, in school for design, and she's really good on the computer. She can, like, wrap type around a flagpole. And so the gentleman, uh, Tim Myrick, actually, kind of called Keith Holiday and Elsie Meskety all up. They had this conversation, and they said, well, bring her in. We want to meet her. Now, I really thought I was just going to be making coffee. Like, I figured, you know, I had a two-year degree at that point. I figured I was just going to be making coffee. And so when Tim saw my portfolio, he kind of was like, oh, you know what you're doing. We're going to do something different with you then. And I kind of was like, Wow. And they made me work on a newsletter. Now, this was like early, late 90s. And so InDesign hadn't even been out yet. We were still using Quark and PageMaker. And Illustrator was like Illustrator 88, like before they even moved to the numbered versions. Mm -hmm. And it was so crazy because in one internship, I had to learn how to use Photoshop, Illustrator. I had to learn how to work with copywriters. I had to learn how to retouch, and I had to learn how to draw objects, like car parts, from scratch to put into this newsletter, and you create it in PageMaker. So for what I thought I was going to do versus what I actually ended up doing was crazy. But what I found out was when I came back to school the next semester, I was way ahead of a lot of the other students, way ahead. Not just so much on the computer, but because I had the opportunity of working with other professionals Um, collaborating, not just doing design, like I said, more so in in engaging how this is going to come out and what does it need to do and looking at it from that aspect. And and it really opened a huge door, not just to my career, but to my thought process 
it was a wonderful opportunity. I loved it. Now, you mentioned that you have a two-year degree, and you also have another degree from the, the University of Akron. What was your time like there studying design? Um, you know, my time at the University of Akron, again, was super great. I was very, very fortunate. I had such a wonderful group of people um, around me who saw my talent and who had even greater vision to what I could do with it than I even had at that point in time. When I went to the University of Akron, they were working on their minority retention program. And so there was a group called Peer Counseling. And it was headed up by Colleen Curry. And she was just very active in all of our lives. She was like the first black professional woman I saw. She actively became everybody's mom on campus. When she called you, it was up there as if your mother had called. And she saw me doing something really much more phenomenal than I imagined. I mean, because when I went to college, I hadn't heard about design before. I had not. I thought I was going to be a watercolor painter. And mm. when I went to college and I met Miss Curry and I, she looked at my work and she would always push me to try to do different things. She actually is the one who got me into event planning. And um, she just never let me or my talent rest. Anytime I thought I had figured something out or I had accomplished something, she always put something in front of me to think about doing even greater. And for that, I just, I'm just ridiculously grateful that she even saw it way before I did. A lot of the things that I'm doing now are things that she thought I could have done then. <laughs> mm -hmm. So after you left the University of Akron and you said you were doing this design internship, mm -hmm. tell me kind of some of the other places that you worked or things that you've done as a design strategist. Oh, wow. Well, I was also the graphic designer for Cleveland Public Schools. It was 122 schools and seven administrative sites. Um, I was replacing a woman who had been, who had retired, and she had a Quadra Mac. Like, this is how long she had been there, and this is how much of a change they needed. Um, my supervisor there, Montre Wrecker Adams, she called me and said, hey, I see your work. I'd like to interview you. And I'm thinking, I didn't even know school districts hired graphic designers. I thought they outsourced a lot of that work. But because of a lot of the financial constraints Cleveland was going through, they really needed to kind of save costs and bring those creative services in-house. And for seven years, I designed for many different departments, many different disciplines. I remember doing lots of projects for the multicultural department. I remember doing tons of projects um, for Barbara Bird Bennett. I remember doing tons of uh, teaching projects. Um, we used to design these huge calendars in Cleveland. We would go to the schools, each school, and pick out pieces of artwork, and we would have auctions, so to speak, of our student artwork, and that's what we would decide to put into the calendar. And Barbara would come down, and she would do, like, the final vote. They were huge pieces. But the best thing about doing those calendars, especially being at the school district, was I couldn't just look at how pretty it was. I had to look at how it was designed and who we used for the photographer and where we got the art and what the message was and where the words came from. You know, I had to look at the cost, you know. And so it really made my design doing ability just stretch and grow. What have been some of the particular high points of your career? I have some, but I still think I got a few more left in me. I loved working as the graphic designer for the Division of Water. I loved it, especially those early years. I mean, they were phenomenal. Um, being at the Division of Water, again, another opportunity for me to kind of go a little bit further than what I thought and to do a little bit more. The division, again, had a financial issue that they needed to kind of bring products and services in-house. They could no longer outsource a lot of things. And many municipalities are going through that right now. But the beauty was I was the first designer. <laughs> so I got to set up the policies. I got to set up the procedures. I got to set up the people that we worked with. Um, I got to mentor all of the design interns. Like, I did all of that. And it's funny because even though I'm not 
there, they're still using a lot of the policies and, and things that I set up. So it, it's kind of gratifying to know that I, I did that right. You know, I did that right. I opened some doors for some people. I put some people in positions. I was able to take a little publication job and turn it into like this department. I used to love when people called and they'd say, I, I need to speak to the graphic department. I need to speak to the manager. And I would be like, well, it's me. And they would say, well, who else did this project? Or who's doing this? Or who's working on that? And I would say, I did all of those. And it would always be so surprising to people because they always just thought, like I did previously, that it was outsourced, that some other person, you know, not attached to it. You know, um, I got to do an annual report, more calendars, bill inserts. Our water quality reports were, were infamous because not only were they well-produced and well-designed pieces, but I was able to take the cost from like 25 cents when I first got there, and that's what the previous team were doing, down to like three cents. And so it's like almost 82%. And that, that's like somebody's job. You know what I'm saying? That kind of money, it's, it's a lot of money. And it was good for the division because they were able to do more work because I was in-house as opposed to being an outside firm that they kind of had to go to extra channels to connect with. So I enjoyed that. So I think you mentioned this earlier that a lot of the places that you've, you've worked at have kind of been in the, um, I guess you could say in the government type of sector, like they've been more more public facing type of works. And what I see from a lot of designers nowadays is that they try to work for things that are more maybe private sector, big business, things like that. Why did you, I guess, choose to do something that was more civic minded with your design? Yeah, I hear you. And, and you're right. It, it's such a huge it, it is a task to decide that you are going to work for a municipality because there are just some things that are not going to happen as opposed to mm -hmm. you work in corporate America. You know, right. like uh, when you work in corporate America, you're looking for that that raise every nine months or every year. And, you know, you're looking for that when you work for the city or a school district you get that raise, you might be at that pay rate for two or three years, if you even are able to get a raise, you know. Being, working at the city and the school district, it is about service. It's one of the reasons that, as you mentioned, I am very civic-minded. It makes you see a greater need and a greater opportunity for your talent. So many times when you're in school, you know, you're like, hey, I'm going to design logos or I'm going to do brands. I'm going to make websites. You know, that's kind of what you see, and that's what they kind of feed you at the, at the um, high school and even at the college level. But if you really, really look at how big design is and everything that it can do, the opportunities become endless. And so those are mm -hmm. some of the things that I've tried to focus my career on. Now, currently you're pursuing a Master's of Fine Arts degree at The Ohio State University. Can you tell us what your area of focus is? Yeah, I am studying the lack of diversity in design. And so my topic asks, what is an effective tool to expose African-American and Latino youth to design-related careers? What I'm actually working on is developing this tool. I've been researching eminent designer 20 plus years, my senior, you know, my senior, looking at their career paths and what are some things that they did I'm also investigating and researching what are some things designers 20 years my junior, because they've had technology, like what are some things that they're doing and how can we group them together and how can we combine this to increase the opportunities for students at the K-12 level? Because after a lot of the research that I've done, that's where I see the problem lying at. And so we have great designers coming through, edu through college education places. It's it, just wonderful. But when you look at them making it through the entire pipeline of this thing called a career, rather it be an entrepreneurial, doing something um, for a nonprofit, you know, just getting to this end, you know, doing RFQ, you know, being able to spec work and, and things like that, that is a huge journey. And if you're not strong enough in the beginning, you won't make it through. And so that's why being able to help young designers develop these talents to make that journey, that's really what I want to do. 
You know, I, I want to be able to put something together to help them. I don't know through my research. I am still investigating if this tool is a website or if this tool is an app or if this tool is an ebook. You know, I, I'm still investigating. But being here has again broadened my view as to the possibilities of design. There's some amazing people down here, and the opportunity to do graduate school at this point in my career was truly a godsend. It was unexpected, total godsend. I, I, it's been amazing. You know, I was about to ask sort of how your your research is going, but do you feel that it needs to be a a singular thing, like you said, it could be an app or a website or an ebook. Do you feel, I guess, from the research that you've done, that it needs to be one singular tool? Well, ultimately, big picture, big, big picture, all right, even beyond my thesis, is to create some sort of portal. Because right now, we don't have any tools, okay? Our black design students, when they come to college, they are learning Eurocentric design, okay? And Sylvia Harris talked a little bit about this in the Black Aesthetic article. And I agree with her because if you're trying to make it through this journey, you're going to have to have a little bit more than just that, especially being a black designer. You're going to have to have a little bit more than Eurocentric design abilities. You're going to have to know a little bit about your history and a little bit about your culture. And so this tool that I'm creating, this portal, once I figured out what the single solitary tool is, I want to develop it on a broad scale so that it can encompass perhaps lesson plans for educators, you know, because we don't have any materials for this audience. Apps and educational tools. If you go to the art store right now and say, hey, give me a book about black artists or give me a book about black designers, you're not going to get it. It's not one mm-hmm. book. You might find a book that's got three pages. They're going to talk about Henry Tanner. <laughs> They're going to hopefully talk about Aaron Douglas. And they might, by the grace of God, talk about James Vanderzee, the photographer. But you're not going to find a compilation of anything. And so ultimately, that is what I want to create. So I am very open to if it's an app and a website. I'm very open to if it's a ebook series of something and lesson plans. I'm even more open to if it's um, like reviews. You know, we don't have anybody in our neighborhood and our schools with our kids developing that talent. So those are the types of things that if I am able to compile this and gather the proper amount of, of research, you know, that's really what I want to try to put together. Even in doing my focus groups, it's been wow, because the things that black designers are telling me as far as how they came into this field and what their influencers were and things that helped and things that didn't help. I'm hearing a lot of that as well. Things that didn't help me become a, gr- a better designer. We need to know that, and that needs to be somewhere. So people, and especially young people and parents, can have a way to figure this out for their kids, to help them. What are some of those things that they're telling you? Oh, oh, okay. Uh, Well, my favorite one that I've heard so far is art history. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I don't know. Did you ever have to take art history when you were in school? Uh, No, I was, I was a math major. I didn't, I didn't take any design class. (laughs) Well, art history is what they call a feeder class, meaning that is really hard, is very intense. It's, multidisciplinary okay and it's almost a three-hour class where you sit in the dark and you look at pictures of art history now they usually start these art history classes like at 100 bc you know this is like before people were doing like cave paintings on the wall and they usually take it up to about you know 1980 2000 depending on how current of a textbook you have but the problem here is it's only about eight black people in the book So I remember when I took the class, I asked my teacher, you mean to tell me in 2000 years of history that only eight black people did something notable? (laughs) And um, he was kind of just like, 
well, this is the book we're using. You got to get your own information. You got to go find mm-hmm. it yourself. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, if they were notable, why do I have to go somewhere else? If they were notable, why can't everybody know about it? You know, why, why is it in a different book? Mm-hmm. And um, I hear a lot of designers about why that class. Like, I understand it, but the value of it, not hearing much from it. Another thing that I'm hearing a lot of <laughs> a lot of designers say that maybe weren't as helpful or high school art class. Because what they're telling me is that the high school art class, you do get a chance to see a lot and try a lot. But it really depends on how savvy your art teacher was that you got to do the design pieces. So you might have had to wait till like junior year or senior year before you even heard about the word design, you know? So a lot of people are saying that they didn't, you know, kind of like that part. I don't know if you remember this term, this whole key lining process. I hear a lot of young designers saying that they don't understand the purpose of learning that. What's that? Key lining is something that was done in the early, early, early 1900s. And it's basically the process of printing. You know, um, you create an, a stat or a picture of an image. You paste it down to a whiteboard. You add different layers of text and type to it. It's very popular in a lot of the playbills um, mm-hmm. from the early 1900s. You know, a lot of the work that uh, Aaron Douglas did with fire, a lot of that was key lined and it's okay. basically just a way of, of that they printed before this whole electronic printing came along mm-hmm. I think I remember from my interview that I did with Emery Douglas he talked a lot about mimeographing I don't know if that's sort of a, a predecessor to this or not yes yes uh, but it sort of sounds like the same thing yes yes all in the same family and and a lot of the younger designers that I've been talking to they don't understand the why they have to learn that, you know, Mm -hmm. like what is the significance? And they don't understand how it connects to this electronic thing. Because if this Mm -hmm. electronic thing is what we're doing right now, then why do I need to know what a stat is? Why is ruby lip important? Why is rubber cement? Why do you have so much rubber cement around? (laughs) Mm -hmm. You know, but it's, it's been phenomenal talking to so many different designers about their influencer and their background. It's, it's definitely helping me shape where I want this to end up at. So this might be a bit of a, a moot question, but <laughs> what is your opinion, I guess, of diversity in the design community now? And before you answer this, something that you mentioned earlier kind of about there's not really uh, resources or books or things like that. I was looking the other day trying to find Saki Mafundikwa, who did a TED Talk about African alphabets. He has this book he wrote called African Alphabets. Mm-hmm. And that book is $150. Whoa. Exactly. Now, you already know anybody. <laughs> and I, hold on, and I, and I don't want to alienate anybody, and I'm not trying to stereotype, but I'm simply saying that if you just graduated from college, and you've only been working at your job nine months, you're not about to drop 150 on that book. Right. That's a, I mean, that's a high price for, I think, any book, <laughs> design or not, 150 That's a That's a very expensive price. Because I was, you know, I wanted to see it. I'm going to have to see if I can find it in the library here. But that's a lot. A- that's a lot. And that's one of the few books that I can think of just off the top of my head that would feature or have something that would deal with sort of black design, or I guess in this case, you know, African typography, yeah. but I feel like that's related in the whole diaspora. So, yeah. but going, going back to my earlier question though, what is your opinion that you see of, uh, of the current design community? I see it on twofold issue. There's the us and then the them. All right. Okay. We have to participate with us and I'm sure everybody who's listening understands what us is. We have to mm-hmm. participate with us. We have to work with each other. We have to support each other. We have to look and take advice from one another, whether it be good or bad. However, we also still have to work and do these exact exact same things with them. You know? Okay. Because neither is going away. Us ain't going away and them not going away. Mm -hmm. Not going away. So when we talk about diversity... We have to learn how to play together. You know, we got to learn how to play in the same sandbox. You don't got to stay there all day, you know? 
some people just put their six to eight hours in and they dip out. But mm -hmm. we have to learn how to play together in this sandbox. And while we're learning to play together in this sandbox, they have to learn how to play together in the sandbox. Because the mm -hmm. responsibility of diversity simply cannot lie on people of color. Amen. It, it simply cannot be our responsibility. Now, I have a thought process. I know, once again, this might make some folks mad, but I believe diversity is a bottom-up issue. But I believe racism is a top-down situation. And okay. so when we talk about... When we, talk about where does diversity stand i think the designers who are in the game right now are the soldiers you know we're the ones saying that hey we're here we're not going anywhere we're not hiding you're going to keep getting this design work you're going to keep mm -hmm. getting you know <laughs> you're going to keep getting it and i'm not going to stop but with that same drive and energy and passion some of us who are able to have to be able to talk to them. We have to. It's, it's not good enough to only do one side. Mm -hmm. It's not productive. It, it's highly counterproductive. Our world is global now. You know, like it's not just black and white and brown. It's like mm -hmm. purple and pink. It's got some magenta, some green. It's got some, <laughs> you know, our, our world is global. So it's important to be able to understand where you are in your part in your history so that mm -hmm. when you get to that place, you can be truly, truly effective. You can be truly, truly impactful. It's, it's kind of hard to explain, but that's kind no, of... No, no, I, I see what you're saying. Do you think people might be put off by that, that sort of dichotomy that it has to be kind of an us-them situation? The us-them situation that I talk about is not an or. It's like a and slash or, you know? Mm -hmm. I almost feel like you can't have one without the other. If you study African-American history, you will understand that many of us were brought here. So those of us who were brought here, there is a disconnection to our, to our continent. Many other nationalities, they have a land base to go back to. They have a land base to go back and say, hey, how did you guys do it over there so we can do the same thing here so that we can get our strength or we can get support? But many African-Americans here don't have you know, we We just don't have that. And so being able to work both sides or, or being able to participate and still feel confident and strong about yourself, critical skills. It's a critical skill set. I agree. I agree with that wholeheartedly. I like to tell people that diversity is not a zero-sum game. <laughs> yes. Essentially meaning that, you know, because there are people that are out there advocating for more diversity, for, you know, gender diversity, racial diversity, etc., that does not mean that someone else is being, you know, kind of short-shrifted yes. because of that. Yes, yes. And, and I, I love, you know, I love going to the black art store. And I love going to the black bookstore. I love it. And we need more of those. We need the black design bookstore while you're playing. Um, mm -hmm. But we need everybody to come to the black bookstore because there's value in it for everyone. You know? Um, and I know there are a lot of people who aren't real supportive of inclusion, but it's hard to tackle diversity without inclusion. It's a hard pill to swallow, which is why I believe diversity is a bottom up kind of issue. You know, it's something that the people who aren't getting it are kind of like, hey, this isn't right. <laughs> we need to do something about this. Or, right. hey, I'm not going to keep taking this. That You let one person do this. And then when I put my design on the table, then you want to have a conversation, you know, mm -hmm. because I think the people who are at the top who have the power could have. If, if they really wanted to make the change, they could have did it already. They got the power and the money. <laughs> they could have been and made the change. Easily and quick. Way quicker than, than, than what you and I are both doing. Way quicker. Mm -hmm. One thing that I, I know I've told people when it sort of comes to diversity in, in companies particularly is that, you know, it, it sort of has to affect them on a bottom line level. Like if it affects their bottom line, 
I think then this is something which they'll look at and say, okay, we probably need to think about, you know, diversity. Yes. Other than that, it's it's sort of a hard sell for them on a, um, I think on a cultural standpoint, Mm -hmm. it's a hard sell when you think about companies and how essential it is for them to have a particular culture fit, particularly creative companies and agencies. Mm -hmm. It's very important to sort of have that that culture fit. So unless it sort of affects their bottom line, they may not feel like it's an issue to even tackle. I think that you're definitely on point. You are definitely on point that it has to affect the bottom line. What those companies who are kind of ignoring or not seeing the value of, of diversity, what they don't understand is that, you know, the 21st century is bringing about some serious problems, serious. And one type of person ain't going to be able to figure this out. It's going to take all of us at the table. Everybody's going to have to be here to figure some of this stuff out. One of the things that I used to really, really, really love to do when I worked, especially at the city, as I am talking about design, I relate it to money. As I am putting out these processes and procedures on how we should roll this out, when we should get things printed, I'm also equating, hey, here's the money. And, and if I went into a meeting like that, I had everybody's attention. Mm-hmm. But if I went in and I said, wow, you know, we're trying to reach this audience. Here's the photography we should use. Here are the colors that would do it. Here's a great layout. Here's a rollout plan to be able to engage them. It would kind of be like, oh, okay, well, well okay, well, let, let, we've had your part of the meeting. Let's talk about this part now. You know, they wouldn't see the value of it. And... For the companies who are getting the picture, who are supporting the diversity, their profits are amazing. You know, if if you go back and you research companies who have actively sought out to diversify and realize there are four levels of diversification. That's another thing that a lot of people don't know. For companies who actively seek out this, they have these well-roundabout teams that are doing some amazing things in the design world. And that's how they do it, because everybody's at the table. Not just them, not just us, it's we. What are those four levels of diversification? Well, you know, of course, you know, there's race. That's an easy one. You know, there's physical. Putting handicap, like, rails. You know, rails for people who are physically challenged so that Mm -hmm. they can get around. Being able to fit your doors so that a wheelchair, you know, could come through, you know, gender. And this is the one that right now a lot of people are kind of getting tripped up over. And the gender one is not, it's women, it's sex, it's like, it, the, the gender one is crazy. And then there is sex. And so a lot of times what happens were, you know, that I've witnessed, the company has a diversity policy, okay, and then the recruiter has a diversity policy. And a couple times, the policies mm. ain't the same. So right. the recruiter is divert. He, he or she is recruiting for what they feel is diversity. And then the company has a diversity policy. So people are so touchy about the word diversity that many times companies don't sit down and say, okay, this is what we believe diversity is. You know, many companies don't even have diversity policies or strategies. There's no plan. There's no, hey, here's what we believe. Here's how we're going to work to make it happen. Here's how we're going to work to keep it happening, (laughs) you know. And that's where a lot of times we mess up. I I think that's where a lot of companies have messed up. It's kind of sad. Well, speaking of, of companies that have sort of realized that they need to have you know, more diversity and things of that nature. Let's talk a little bit about WMC Fest. Both of us will be at WMC Fest uh, coming up soon. Yay. And you've actually had a, a pretty instrumental part in in working with them this year. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. You know, this that conversation probably started about like three years ago. Actually, before I went to grad school, even before then, I had an intern, uh, one of my mentees, loved him to death. And um, he loved this conference. When he heard about it, he was just, every day I heard about this conference. And uh, so I'm like, okay, well, you know, let me see it. So I had him bring me the information. And I go to the website, and I look on the roster, and they've got, like, one black person. I was, (laughs) 
this touched me on such a core level. I called my other design friends, like, do you all know this? Have you gone to this conference? It like I instantly became engaged. I could not believe that in and at the time this was like 2012, 2011, I couldn't believe that in 2000 this conference couldn't find black designers to participate. Like I was just aghast. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And um, I called about, like I said, nine, ten of my other friends. We had a Google Hangout the year after this happened. You know, the year after my student introduced me to the conference. And I, we talked about, like, what are we going to do about this? Like, we need to get together. Somebody needs to call this man. Somebody needs to say something. And one of the people on the chat said, well, you know, maybe he don't know. And I really, that, that really shook me. Like, you know, is it possible in 2010 that you don't know about diversity? Like, is it it's, it's possible? And, and that, wait a minute, and that's what you know. That's what she was telling me. You know, she was like, you know, Jacinda, it's possible. We had another gentleman on the chat who he was kind of like, well, you know something. I went. I took my friend. We went. We were the only two black people that went to the conference, and people were looking oh. at us strange. He was like, you know something. I ain't doing it. I'm starting my own conference, and he did, and he has, and I'll be at his conference as well. Oh. <laughs> What is that conference? It's called the Creative Control Fest. It's here in Columbus, and it's going to be on September 12th and 13th. You can reach out to uh, Marshall Shorts for that. And um, I have a really great thing I want to kind of plug a little bit. Myself and another couple other designers, we're going to be doing portfolio reviews at the Creative Control Fest. So I'm hopeful that people, young people who are hearing this and they want feedback on their work, they want to talk about interviewing and professional development and all that come because we're going to have people there that can help answer your questions that can help you move to that next level in your career but that night marisa was so funny because marshall was like i'm not doing it he was like i'm gonna start my own conference and so a couple other people in the chat was like well what are we going to, you know what are we going to do about this conference and my friend who said you know she was like what if he doesn't know That really struck me. Like, maybe he doesn't know. And so I said, okay, well, before, you know, before we go riding and picketing, I'm going to call him. I'm going to ask. I mean, mean, what can it hurt? He can only hang up on me, right? I mean, and so uh, I called him up out of the blue. I didn't schedule a call. I didn't call the secretary. In fact, I remember talking to the secretary like I even knew him. Like, hey, I'm going to look and speak with Jeff. (laughs) Like, oh, we go way back. Like. Can you just put him on the phone real quick? And mm-hmm. so he came to the phone, and I asked him flat out, why don't you have any black people at your conference? Are you, do you just not know? Do you need some people? Because I can give you some people. And he met me with a little insecurities, some insecurities. He met me with shock. And I would even go so far as to say a touch of, wow, I didn't know and I didn't realize And so I said, hey, listen, we should put something together for your conference, for the black people who will come. And he instantly let me know that he wasn't sure what the demographics were and he wasn't sure about how this would work. And, you know, I'm like, you know something, I'll do it. I will take all of the responsibility. I will do it. You know, Mm -hmm. what I need is I, I need a booth and I need some FaceTime. Give me a space to have a workshop. I will do it myself. And so that's what I did. I, I would even I would even interject to say that conference organizers they know about those demographics because <laughs> they have to have that to get sponsors. And, and I knew that he knew, but the problem, the bigger problem here is, is that he did what most people in his position does do. He asked his friends. You know, mm-hmm. he said, "Hey, I'm having a conference. I'm going to be doing blank, blank, and blank. Would you in, yeah. be interested in participating?" You know, because first of all, conferences are really expensive and and they do take a lot of time and energy. I get that part. So Mm -hmm. in the beginning, you need people who are going to kind of help. You understand? Help. Maybe not handle it, but help. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of what he did. And that's what he explained to me, you know, over the phone. And Jeff Finley was very like, wow, okay, well, let's just see. You know, what Jeff didn't realize was that I had been marketing and promoting our booth, the Organization of Black Designers, Midwest Chapter, we were going to be at this conference to come, sign up, get us registered, let us get your email, let us connect with you. You know, we had, um, I had phenomenal booth members. 
we had uh, Clarence Merriweather who drew for two and a half days. He sketched just so we could get people to come and talk about this thing called black designers, you know? And so many people came because of the emails we sent out, because of the calls we made. Um, we got John Jennings to be on our panel. He sent us back an email literally overnight, like, yes, I'll do it. I'll help however you need. And we had this small little panel discussion workshop thing off to cut to the side of the theater. We called it the hot box room. It was so hot in there. We were just like, okay, fine. We're going to have this conversation no matter where you put us. But what we didn't realize, Maurice, which was really funny, was that they came. The them, you know, that we talk about, mm -hmm. they came. <laughs> and many of them were so shocked by the things we discussed and by the things we admitted to and the challenges and the issues of being a black designer in this world and in your companies, what it's like, what it's really like, mm -hmm. that they were just like, whoa, like, whoa. And um, this year, Jeff and Todd called me and asked if I would participate. And again, yes, I'll do it. Because I know that as his conference grows, that whole thought process of the us and the them comes back and hits me in the face, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I can't sit here and do nothing anymore. You know, I, I've, I've put my 20 years in the game already. I, I put my 20 years in already. I've gotten my awards and my accolades and, you know, the stuff that comes with being a designer. I got that already. But what happens when my 15-year-old niece tells me, Auntie, I want to be a designer like you. Do I want her coming into the industry like this? Mm -hmm. I, can't, I, I can't let her come into this industry knowing that I didn't do whatever I could to make it better for her. You know, now she's 17 and she's looking at colleges and it's even scarier. <laughs> so being able to set something up for us and for them is important for me. This year at, at the WMC conference, we're going to have this conversation on the main stage. I've already got some calls of why you're going to do that. How come we going to do it? I've already gotten those calls. And to them, I say, you may have had this conversation 20 years ago, but clearly it wasn't documented. Or clearly you can't tell me how it went so that I can continue it or even improve on where things may have not gone right. Mm -hmm. You know, but just because it happened doesn't mean it can't happen again and doesn't mean that this might not be the change doesn't mean that the people who are involved on this time this part of the conversation can't do something different and I, I think our magnet our, our impact as black designers is even greater now than it was 20 years ago you know what I'm saying so many more of us are doing the entrepreneurial track so many of us are starting nonprofit organizations to help you know, I, I listened at some of your past interviews, especially the one with the guy from the Interpac, in, um, Interact. Interact Project. And, Smart you sports. know, yes. And before you even ask me what my dream job is, I'm putting it out there. I want that job. That is the job. You know, that is the job I want because that what he's doing in that small area, if that were able to roll out to like national and a global spectrum, Maurice, it would change the game. And it would change the game at a part, at the K-12 part of education, not just the college part, the K-12, mm -hmm. which is where the impact is really suffering. So when we go to the Weapons of Mass Creation Festival this year, the panel is going to be phenomenal. Um, like you said, yourself, we got Antonio Garcia from Gravity Tank, Luis Cabrera from Forest City, we got Donald G. Wooten. He is a phenomenal screen printer, designer, web person in the Baltimore area. Angela Townsend is um, our moderator. It's definitely going to be a good conversation. Yeah, I, I think we're going to bring it. I think it's going to be really good. It's going to be. It's, <laughs> and, and the funny thing is, we I got my impact facts, Maurice. I can't wait to share them with you. I got my impact. I got my three impact fact numbers. It's going to be a, a main conversation. And one of the things that I spoke with Jeff about was that when we do that, when we do this conversation this year, you are officially committing to diversity. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You are committed. Absolutely. You can't poke your toe in this diversity pool and then dip out. Now, you could probably try, 
but trust and believe I am here, I am watching, I am listening, <laughs> and I will not let you forget your impact, your commitment to this. And I'm looking at other activities years down the road that black designers will be engaged at at this conference. And I'm also looking at what can they do to come help people like Marshall Shorts? You know, why can't we cross pollinate? You know, like, uh, why can't we do these types of things? Um, right. But that goes back to the us and the them, you know, like it's yes, they're two different groups, but we're in a global world and our circles will overlap someday. They're already overlapping. It's crazy. You know, in, in doing my thesis work, I've had a chance to like see the surveys, Maurice. You know, these are like the surveys they don't really, really talk about. You know, sometimes when you read an annual report, they put the little asterisk next to the numbers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and they, they put the asterisk like, oh, we read this, this survey and, and, you know, this is where we got our facts from. Well, they got this little thing out called the HEAD survey, and it stands for Higher Education Arts Data Summary. Okay. Higher Education Arts Data Summary. And they poll like almost 300 schools with art and design programs. And they rank the numbers. They look at ethnicity. They look at faculty. They look at everything. What the schools are teaching, who they teaching, how, you know, what the graduates are doing. Like they look at everything. Maurice, this report is so painful to read, especially if you're a black designer. It just made my heart ache <laughs> in, in reading this report because they're talking about like for 7,400 faculty people, you know, mm-hmm. guess how many people are black? Let's say 3%. 311 people. <laughs> so of the 7,400 educators, mm-hmm. only 300, 300 are black men and black women. So when you look at the fact that a little more than 10,000 of all the design students, that body, that body of students are black, it's like a two to four ratio. You know, like the ratio is ridiculous. Black, young black designers will never have that equal footing. You know know what I'm saying? It's, It's like the cards are stacked against us. And so doing conferences like, the weapons and doing conferences like Creative Control and South by Southwest. And that's why these are important because that's where our students are going to get their education. You Mm -hmm. know, they should be getting it at school and as much as it costs to go, but the numbers are are just painful. They're very, very painful. I'm going to be debuting more of them, you know, at weapons, but to, to see them, it, it just makes your head, it just makes your heart hurt. And, so when I meet designers and black graphic designers who are like, oh, I don't have time to help. I don't have time to participate. I, no, no, you, you guys just go ahead. Keep me posted. Mm-hmm. I, it just makes me cringe because this ship won't change direction until we all decide that it has to change. It can't just be one or two of us pushing the whole boat. You know? Right. We, no, I agree. We yeah. have to do this in unison. When someone hollers right, We all have to go right to be able to make the distance and the move that is required for true success in this industry for black designers. Well, I also think it's to sort of speak on that point that also they just really don't know the history or they don't know the statistics. So even just asking and, and maybe it could be just how it's it's phrased. Like I see this a lot when people ask about things, they just ask in a very general fashion. But if you can give someone something specific that they can do, even with limited time, mm-hmm. that might help in terms of, like, bringing in their involvement. So you were talking about surveys. I know that Alista Part used to do a, um, a web design survey every year. They started in 2007, and it was a really comprehensive look at sort of, well, what are the demographics of the design industry? And they, and they mostly did it about web design, I think web design and mm-hmm. web development. And they did that survey for, I want to say, five years. They did it from 2007 to 2011. Mm-hmm. And then they just sort of magically stopped for yeah. some reason. And I remember that first year because I wrote a piece for Black Web 2.0 called Where Are the Black Web Professionals? Mm-hmm. Because I looked at the basically the data that they pulled from the survey and thought, okay, well, out of all of the people that took the survey, I think 
about 1% of those people that took the survey were black <laughs> or that identified as black, yeah. I should say. Most of those, I think, were males. Oh, yeah. So so black women. So we're talking, there were like 32,000 respondents. Out of 32,000 respondents, I think less than 100 were black women. Yep. And so the survey breaks it down by you know geography, age, gender, ethnicity, salary. It's a very, very comprehensive look at it. They stopped it in 2011. They didn't really mention why. Mm. And then Net Magazine, I believe, tried to pick it back up or they did something very similar. Yeah. In 2012, they did like a web design and, and development survey. And I noticed that they omitted race. Oh, now, they talked oh, about age and location, yes. Oh, yes. expertise and gender. They talked about different, you know, industry sectors and languages and, you know, CMS platforms and a bunch of things. But that part was left out. I don't know if it was intentional. I'm not, <laughs> really, I'm not Maurice, positing you, that or anything. <laughs> but I think it's important because, like you say, if we don't, if this stuff is not documented yes. in a way where people know what are the numbers, what are you know things that are coming out, that's very important to be able to make cases for more diversity, to make cases for, you know, black designers. I think in this industry as a whole. But speaking but of the, the work that can I can I touch no, on that really fast. We yeah, have, yeah, go ahead. Um, part, remember we talked about the uh, the higher art survey. There's another one out that, again, this one just makes me mad, the National Architectural Accreditation Survey. Now, you know whenever they need to get information about designers, wink, wink, okay, they go to architects, all right, because architects are certified, all right? You have to register to be an architect. So those are the okay. numbers, you know what I'm saying, that they use to answer questions and to, okay, but check this out. And they did not begin to separate the numbers until 1999, Maurice. So anything that happened before 1999 with this national accrediting board, okay, uh-huh. didn't get documented. Didn't get documented, Maurice. We have, so we have no numbers on black architects before 1999. No national numbers. No numbers so that you can go to a company and say, hey, here's why you should have a diversity policy. Hey, here's why your company should adopt a school in an inner city. You know, like nothing to validate that. And they literally grouped men, okay, and women, and then other. Now, of course, that other pot was massive. Yeah. (laughs) But it wasn't separated. So you didn't know what the numbers were who the numbers were. And if you happen to be like, let's just say black and Latino and female, you got into the other bucket, whether you are a woman or not. And so they put race first and then sex. <laughs> so hmm. people of color, again, never got to the table, just never even got to the table. Wow. So we were talking earlier about the, a lot of the work that you've done before. And, and one of the organizations that you've really worked a lot with is the organization of black designers. Yes. Now, for those that are out there listening, can you tell us? I mean, I think the name is pretty self explanatory, <laughs> but can you just tell us kind of some more information about the organization of black designers, what they're doing, things like that? Yeah, I can tell you kind of what I know up until I went to grad school. I first learned of them probably like around, I'd say about 2000 maybe 2004, because they were doing conferences um, in the early years, as they call them. They were doing conferences every year, but maybe like the last 10 years, they started doing them every other year. I heard about OBD, and I instantly was, I knew I had to be wherever they were, you know, wherever there were other black designers. And understand that many of the, the people that I'm talking to you about, as far as those who mentored me, they were not black designers. So I never had a black design mentor. Like, so to, when I heard of OBD, the first thing I thought was, oh my gosh, I hope I meet somebody here. You, like, my whole mm-hmm. mind opened up. And so um, I called for a long, long, long time, and I aggressively per- pursued a dialogue. <laughs> and I finally got in contact with, with um, David Rice. David Rice is the founder and president, you know, CEO and all that kind of good stuff, OBD. And he has spent his life working for the cause of black designers. In 2012, I had an opportunity to work as the Midwest coordinator where I went to 
cities like, you know, Cleveland, Detroit, places like that, and had events and just tried to see where the pockets were. You know, where are we at? I really like a lot of the work that OBD had done in the past. And so that is why I was so excited to be involved. And um, that's why I pushed so hard, especially in Cleveland, to, to do something about it. I know that they haven't been as active these last couple of years. I know that David and uh, Keir Worthy, who also is, serves as the executive director, it's kind of just them two, you know, them against the world, leading the charge. And, you know, they're, they're, the need is so great that I often wonder how they will fare in this journey, you know. There's so much work to do, Maurice, for black designers. There, there's so very much work to do. And with just them two, I wonder, like, are they enough? Yes. Is, is that kind of what it is? is? Is it enough? Will they be able to answer all the calls? Will they be able to do all of the design? I mean, understand that, you know, David Rice is an industrial designer by trade. So putting together a social media campaign may not be, you know, his forte, you know? Mm -hmm. And because of a lot of the challenges that he has had, in this are you know in this quote unquote war, I, I wonder. I've heard that there's supposed to be a conference that they're trying to put together. Um, I've heard that too. Yeah. It's going to be here. From what I've heard, yep. I'm, I'm using air quotes on this side of the microphone, but <laughs> from too, what I've heard, <laughs> it's in Atlanta, mm -hmm. which is convenient for me since I'm here. But it's in Atlanta. <laughs> it's the first week of November. Mm -hmm. That's all I know. Yep. And, you know, the funny thing is I heard that on Facebook as well. And uh, I don't know. I I, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we're both mincing words here, but I, I get the, mincing, the sentiment I, of what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the cause for my minced words is there's so very much work to be done. Mm -hmm. And you want it to work. You know what I'm saying? Like, you want to be like, yeah. yay, OBD, yes. Yes. No, absolutely. Yeah. But with only two people pushing the boat. See, know. I thought it was more than two people, at least. And this is, and I've had conversations with both Kier and with David, and mm -hmm. they've both told me that there's more than two people. They said, I think there's at least, I don't know, five or six. I don't know if that's the case. Again, but even at five or six, Maurice, five or six. It's not pushing enough. The boat, pushing the boat. Yeah. And then when we talk about, you know, these surveys where, you know, there's actual data, like being able to merge the two, you know, like when I was um, doing OBD, one of the things I had put together a huge list of like events and activities, but these were more local things. But what David explained to me that OBD needs is to be able to reach the masses. We need big things, you know, that, that generate dollars and revenue so that we can continue to even move the ship down the valley, you know, down the river. Mm -hmm. And so that's where a lot of my angst comes in because, you know, you want to help however you can. And right. David and Kier with his five or six people is so Do hard. you think that the, the conferences are enough? Because from what I recall, the conferences are an annual conference. They're like biannual or triannual. So they're not even on a regular or at least on a a consistent enough basis for people to remember about the conference from year yeah. to year. They're like every two years, every three years, yeah. et cetera. Which is what's so interesting at the last conference, at the last conference, I think it was the 2012. Yeah. For 2012, we were in Cincinnati mm -hmm. and um, it was so interesting because I had people from Cleveland come and participate and people from Cleveland where I had been having these smaller kind of events, they were really, really excited. And so when, a million black designers didn't show up, it was a little disappointing. So what I, you know, in my opinion, I think there has to be a, a mix of the two. I think there has to be those big David Rice kind of events. You know what I'm saying? Where we get big time sponsors and we get, you know, big hotels and, you know, where we have prominent designers come and talk about their work. You know, we have to have those big events. But on the flip side, Maurice, remember, because I told you, I'm about trying to get people through. Like, mm -hmm. we got to have some of these smaller events. And not smaller events, multiple events. Do you understand the difference? It's like 
it's almost like what SICK did, you know, the black students, early 60s. It's almost like what they did. They didn't just hit one or two places. Like, they mm-hmm. literally was calling people up, like, okay, you're going to have something in your city. You're going to do something in your city. You're going to do something over here. We're going to do something here. And at 8 o'clock, we all going to do it at the same time to get the power. The activist in me <laughs> really thinks that's something that we will have to do. I hope and I would love to continue to do things with OBD. You know, I, I told David a couple moons back when, you know, before I started school, that as soon as I'm finished here, I will be back. You know, he already knows I, I will be back. I'm not going to leave. I'm not going to not do anything about this cause. But at the same time, I do wish there were more people like you, you know, doing what you're doing with Revision Path and like what Marshall's doing with the Creative Control Fest and what I'm doing here with the numbers and the research search and the youth and you know like I want to connect with all these people you know that's why people like uh, Maurice Woods that you talked about um, mm-hmm. people like him you know I would love to have a conversation with Bill Strickland I've watched so many of his TED talks I've watched so many of his interviews and I've like, like literally have folders of data about all the eight schools that he has because he has you know are you familiar with Bill Strickland that name sounds familiar he has a lot of these art and technology schools. So there's like two. There's one in Connecticut. There's one in San Francisco. There's one in Detroit. You know, so he's got like six, about eight of these schools that I've found. And basically he has them in urban communities. We all know the code word. Okay. He has them mm-hmm. in urban communities. But Maurice, these schools are state of the art. Okay. I'm talking like when I went into the one that we have in Cleveland, I didn't have as much computer equipment at my office and I had a job. Like, (laughs) I mean, just tons of equipment, tons of opportunity. Educators who are professionals, you know, in their industries, working specifically with inner city youth. We need places like OBD to be at these schools, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, to be able to further this boat and to move it, to be able to push it further and to be able to make more of a distance. But we have to be able to do that together. And that's what gives me most, I guess, nervous, makes me a little nervous about OBD is because there's so few people who are, are pushing the boat, you know? Mm-hmm. And it's something on both sides. You know, David Rice has, has done this for so long with his resources that I wonder, you know, he did an interview for a Cleveland publication And he talked about when the mothership calls. And I don't know what's going to happen. You know, I don't know where we will stand. Are we united enough now to be able to move the boat? No. Okay. Yes, I totally agree. Well, I mean, uh, just being honest, I don't think so. Not right now. And so to me, that's why being able to connect the dots is critical. When I do my research and I think about what this tool is, I totally believe you. And I understand what you're saying as far as does it have to be one tool? You know what I'm saying? Like, does it only have to be one thing? I ultimately want to put something together where it's just you only have to go to one place for these resources, for these connections, for these organizations, because I think that is how we will get ahead. We will not get ahead with just David Rice pushing the boat. You know, we won't just get ahead with you pushing the boat. We won't even get ahead with people like Dr. Noel Mayo pushing the boat. I can give you a litany of names. We won't get ahead with just them doing it. It has to be a consorted, consolidated, impactful movement. I I described this to one of my um, instructors, and she's white. And she said, you mean like the Harlem Renaissance? (laughs) And I... Well, and I kind of laugh, but yes, like we have to put something together at that magnitude and it can't, we can't worry about, is it big enough? You know, it, it can't just be, is it big enough? It has to be, how often have we done it? How many times? How many people showed up? How many people came? Do you know where they are? What if I need a black programmer right now? You know what I'm going to have to do, Maurice? What's that? I'm going to have to call you. 
Call me. <laughs> I'm gonna have to call you, Maurice, because you are the closest to programming that I know about. Do you see what I'm saying? That I know about. There, there's. Um, I'm in two, well, three black design Facebook groups right now. I think you and I are in one of the same ones. Yeah. But the thing is, is that in the BDU group, there are about 200, 300, about 300 designers in that group. Okay. Mm-hmm. In the African-American graphic design group, I think there are about 14 or 1,500 people in that group. That one's a little bit bigger. But even then, that's only about 2,000 black designers, okay? Can you right. imagine if 2,000 black designers came together and said, hey, I'm going to give you all the black designers I know, and let's connect. Can you imagine what that power would be? See, that's, no. that's the power <laughs> that is going to take the movie as both. That's the power. And through those numbers and through those efforts and through those initiatives is how we make the impact as designers, as black designers, as designers who aren't just doing design, who are also thinking about design. It is a movement. So when she, when my instructor talked about like, are you trying to do something like the Harlem Renaissance? Like I said, I chuckled, but as I think about it and as I thought more about it that day, yes. I want something on that level. I want something where we're all participating, where everybody knows this is for the same cause. No egos on the table. Like, if you know three black designers, just get their contact information and what they do, and let's pull them together. Like, Mm -hmm. that grassroots, it has to start somewhere, somehow, with something. So I've just decided to spend, you know, the remaining years of my career before, quote-unquote, as David Rice says, the mothership, calls me to make a difference for my niece, for my mentees, for all of the young people who will be left to steer this boat when we are no longer here. You know, like, what will they have? Talk to me about your mentees. I know you do a a lot of mentorship. You mentioned earlier you mentored a lot of of young designers. Talk to us about that. Yes, yes, I, I, I have to say that that has been one of the highlights of my career. It really has been. I didn't think that it would be, but to hear their stories um, and to see them and and to see some similarities and and to see their struggles is you just want to do something. You know, you just, just can't be in a position not to want to do something. I started mentoring when I was at the school district. I, you know, I, I had probably many be only been designing four or five years at that point you know I was a young designer still you know like I couldn't think about being a mentor because I felt I still wanted a design mentor and even at that point in my career I still wanted a design mentor my immediate supervisor got a call from a lady who wanted to have her daughter shadow shadow me and I kind of was like well if she can come I don't know what she's gonna learn you know (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, I don't know what she's going to learn, but because you know, I personally don't think what I do is out of the norm. I think all designers, all black designers are doing this, you know? And so, uh, so she came, her name was Sonia. And when I met with Sonia, she came for like a couple days, you know, and she said, I'm going to come back next week. I was like, you coming back? <laughs> I was like, you saw something that made you want to come back. She was like, being here with you, I think I learned like a whole semester of stuff. And I started thinking about it like I just took her through a couple of projects. (laughs) And um, she was like, I want to come back. I want to come back. And uh, I followed up with Sonia. And Sonia and I, we stayed in touch. She is doing phenomenal. She is a phenomenal web and user interface designer right now in Cleveland. And um, I met many more behind her. I actually have about 16, maybe 20 mentees that I'm working with right now, which does take up a lot, a lot of time, but every minute is worth it. And what's been, what's very interesting is that somehow or other, I have gotten mentees from other races, which always cracks me up. You know, um, I have two white students right now. Um, I have one young lady who's hearing impaired and Maurice. You know, if you think the cause for black designers is serious, think about if you are a black designer with an impairment. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole mass of them out there as well, Maurice. Tori, 
she has such an impactful story, Maurice. I mean, all of my mentees have such impactful stories. And just in listening at them, it really made me go, you know something, this is a continuation. You know what I'm saying? Like, Maurice, I kept seeing the same things happening. And they're not all from the same schools. And they're not all, like I'm saying, I'm telling you, from the same race. They're not all men. They're not all women. You know, I'm seeing some consistencies. And I just think that it's time for a change, that the story won't change even as you go younger than what they are right now. And I Mm -hmm. I work with them on portfolio presentations. We spend a lot of time on portfolio. We spend lots of time on interviewing. In fact, I have a 345 with Jacina because she has a nice little interview set up and she's really excited. I spoke to Amber last week. I emailed William. You know, so we all, (laughs) you know, still get together. At one point, Um, When I realized that they were all kind of going into the workforce, I used to have events at my house in Cleveland. I would cook something and I would make each of them tell the other one something about what they knew about. You had an interview with um, Maurice Wingfield. He was one Mm -hmm. of my mentees for a while. And Maurice would come and talk about web. And William would come and talk about photography and and illustration and, you know, I would have each of them come, just come and tell us what you know. You don't have to dress up. I'm going to cook you a plate of food. I'm going to give you my, I have my own projector. I bought it on my, I bought my own projector and presentation materials so that we could set it up in the living room and we would just come. Sometimes I'd have to pick some of them up. You know, um, Amber would come, her mom would drop her off and she brought her interior design roommate. Mm-hmm. And um, the consistency just became, where are the others at? Or how can I find them? Or how can I ask these questions? Because, you know, there's some questions as a young designer you don't feel confident to ask unless it's somebody that you feel comfortable with. But with us... Yes, please say that. <laughs> you want me to repeat? Repeat, repeat. Repeat that, yes. It is critical. It is critical that senior designers be involved in young designers' lives because they have questions and a need that they will not ask they will not ask unless they feel comfortable with, unless they feel comfortable with you. They, I had a student, promise you, you ready for this, Maurice? He brought me his portfolio in a bag and a jump drive. Like, okay, here's what I got. And I said, did you take this to the job interview? He said, uh-huh. And then he wanted to know why he didn't have a job. And like, he didn't get it, Maurice. And I, he was what I would call, he was ridiculously talented. Still is. But the thing is, is that no one had pulled him to the side. You mo- you remember that conversation, Maurice, when someone pulled you to the side like, mm-hmm. hey, let me explain how this is supposed to look or let me show you. You know, if you don't, you don't have to listen to what I'm saying. Let me show you. And so a lot of what I started doing for my mentees was showing them big picture things, big picture concepts, big picture industry issues that were coming down the pike you know and many of them were kind of like whoa when are they gonna talk about this in school <laughs> or how come they didn't mention this they're not they it just mm-hmm. doesn't happen but fortunately when i was with the urban league we had this thing called, called doers donors and door openers and having my mentees made me realize that I thought I was just a doer. You know, like I thought I was just doing design. But but in working with them and nurturing and and helping and answering the the odd questions, because there's a lot of oddball questions, but there are things that they want to know about that were going to help their work or their portfolio or, or interviewing, that I realized that maybe... Somehow, I don't know when it happened exactly, but I became a door opener. You know, like I became somebody who knew enough people or who had been around long enough where I could make a call and say, hey, I know you're looking for a designer. Let me give you some resumes of some kids I know. Or, hey, um, I know you want this designer to do blank, blank and blank, but you're only paying this amount. Why don't I give a young person a chance? You know? (laughs) Mm -hmm. Why not? And many of the companies um, that I gave this pitch to, they took it and um, they hired about, I'd say about six, maybe seven of my students 
you know, received employment from a call or a conversation or an email that I sent, you know, and I just wanted my other senior design, you know, colleagues, especially the ones of color to do the same. Like I, I wanted everybody to be able to make one call for a young person. And, and many of them said no. And it, it was definitely disappointing, but I can't stop asking and I'm not going to stop making calls. Anybody who knows me knows that I take information from all young people. All you have to do is come to me and say, I'm a young black designer and I need to know blank. You have got my time and talent and my time and energy right that moment. And if I can't talk to you, I give you a car. Like, hey, call me in a couple days. Or I'm swamped right now. Here's my home, my personal cell phone number. Let's talk about this a little bit later. Call me. Stay in touch with me. And I think that's one of the things that has to be done for this move, this shift to happen. It can't just be one or two things. It's a consolidated effort that has to happen. And so working with my mentees has definitely just shown me a different a need. I'm doing some teaching right now at an um, inner city school here in Columbus called Franklinton Prep. And Maurice, they're in the ninth grade. Do you remember the ninth grade? Mm-hmm. You remember what kind of designer you were in the ninth grade? Or, or what kind of I, grade? I wasn't. I was probably just writing in ninth grade. Yes, yes. But the funny thing about the ninth grade students that I have is that they're trying to decide right now if this is a career. And the way young designers make decisions with all this great technology is around is way different than maybe you and I would have made the decision. And so that's the even greater need for having more information out there. It, it's crazy. So mm-hmm. that mentorship piece, that visibility piece, that being at the conferences, that being available, being around is critical. I, I can't stress it enough. I, I just can't stress it enough. So let's switch gears a little bit here. Let's talk more about, I mean, it's about you, but it'll also be about, you know, kind of the work that you do. Mm-hmm. Based on a lot of just what you've said so far, what advice would you give to someone that's just starting out in this industry? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say that, first of all, you have to take a, a stand to be dedicated to lifelong learning, okay? You're not just going to get this degree and stop going to school, you know? The school Mm -hmm. may not be the university that you went to or that college class or that two-year A&T tech place. The school has globalized now. So if you are not dedicated to lifelong learning, you probably won't be very successful in this field. Probably won't be. If you're not willing to buy a book, um, now I'm not saying you got to pay $150 for a book because there's lots of great books. (laughs) 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 But get a subscription. There are so many... Mag- design magazines that are for free. Now, yeah, you got to look a little bit harder for them, but they're free. So if you're not willing to do that, it speaks to the longevity that you're going to have as a designer. I think the other thing, and I know this is going to hurt a lot of people's feelings, but we got to finish college. We got to go and we got to finish. You know how many great, talented people I know who didn't finish? Finishing college is about getting that door open. It's about being able not just to get to the door, it's about being able to go through it and kicking going through it. Like, bam, mm-hmm. we got to finish. We, we got to go. We got to finish, you know, learn the technique, take your talent, get the technique, turn it into something amazing. And then the last thing that, you know, I would tell them is get a mentor. You have to get a mentor. You absolutely have to. I still regret that I waited so late in my career to get mentors, especially in the design industry. I wish I had had a mentor in high school, you know, like when the impact really would have made, (laughs) you know, it would have really made me open my mind to some concepts. But those are the three things. We have to be dedicated to lifelong learning. we got to go to school and finish. We we just have to. I can't stress that enough. And... You know, we we have to seek each other out to help us. You know, it goes back to that us and them thing again. But the us have to help more of us. And the help doesn't have to be something big, you know. Um, Sometimes it's just a phone call. It could be an email. It could be, hey, 
here's how I interviewed for a position like that. Here's some thoughts. You know, the, it doesn't have to be something big all the time. So I think those would be my three takes. Sorry I went on so long. <laughs> no, that's fine. Is, is there anyone or anything that might have stopped you from realizing your full potential? Ooh, yes. Yes. And it's not necessarily a, a person, because, again, I, I've had some amazing people. It, it's just been some, some trials. You know, one of the things I, I talk to my mentees about is right now your task at this age and at this point in your career is to get your life together so that when it meets its reality, you will be strong enough to handle it. You know, you want to be strong enough to be able to to meet those realistic life issues. And uh, I had one. I went to a job interview, a portfolio review, actually, with um, AIGA and put my book out there. I had my cute suit on, you know, because you kind of dress up for these things. And a lady asked me, what did I want to do when I graduated? And I told her. And she maybe about eight, 10 pages into my book, she just stopped Maurice and she just like looked at me shocked. And even though I knew she was kind of looking at me shocked, I kept talking because I'm, I'm thinking like, I gotta, you know, I gotta get this interview. Like I gotta get this. I was like, I gotta get this. And she, all she could say to me, Maurice was, you speak so well for a black girl. Mm. I, I, was just taken aback. I didn't even realize what had just happened there. I didn't even realize that she had just disqualified me. Not, do you understand? She disqualified me. And I've had situations like that. I, you know, I guess because my name is not Afrocentric enough that when I show up to the interview, they're a little shocked to see this little brown skinned black girl show, you know. And so I've had at interviews where I've shown up and, you know, I've sent my portfolio in and they're kind of like, like, oh, you're just in there? And it's kind of like, um, yes, um, um, I am. I actually had one man on a job interview once asked me, he was like, you know, I'm, I hope you don't take this the wrong way, which, you know what that really means, you're about to get disrespected when, you know, when they say, mm-hmm. I don't mean any disrespect. He said, how did you get so much job experience? How long have you been working? <laughs> As if to say, I couldn't have possibly done this own means. You know, somebody had to have done something for you to get you all this work. How'd you do it? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and those types of situations, they were hurtful. You know, I can't really even lie about it. They were shocking and hurtful, and you kind of got to step back like, whoa. But luckily, like I said, I, I had people who were able to let me know how it really is and who were able to guide me through those situations and to help me to understand not just how to answer those crazy questions, but how to persevere even in that type of situation. So, yeah, those are the few little instances, you know, lots of, lots of, I guess, covert discrimination and some very upfront discrimination. Mm Mm-hmm. Are you where you wanted to be at this stage in your life? You know, Maurice, I am just absolutely amazed and blessed. I mean, I I have to give all the glory to God because I didn't see me being here. You know, the mentor I told you about, Mrs. Curry, when I was 19, she asked me to think about doing something like this. And I told her, no, (laughs) I need to get a job. (laughs) You know, my mama ain't going to support me forever. I better get a job. (laughs) (laughs) And she was like, you know, Jacinda, she, Maurice, did what I do to my students sometimes. I make a passionate plea. I know that you probably won't do it, but I I have to make a plea. And at the time, like I said, 19, I didn't know what I didn't know. And she made a plea with me. And she was like, you know, Jacinda, you should really think about this. And she was like you could make such a change in a po- in, in, on the policy level of design. She was like, you've gotten so far, <laughs> you should think about this. And I was like, man, Ms. C- I need to get a job. I'm on a car because, you know, my car is broke down. I need, you know, I wanted stuff. I want a pretty house. And she kind of just looked at me like, okay, 
okay. So, of course, you understand the laugh we had when I called her and I told her I got accepted to graduate school. She was like, I knew it, I knew it, I told you. And so, <laughs> <laughs> so right now, that's why I am so passionate about this. I feel like it's a second chance. I feel like I probably should have been here years ago. And when I preach about doing my part, I didn't do my part then. And so I will not not do my part now. You know, I, I will spend the rest you know, of my career, you know, being an advocate to young black designers and, and developing that, helping them to develop their talent so that they can make the journey, you know, because this, this design thing is a journey. It's not yeah. like a, you go to nine to five, you punch out a clock and you stop. It, this is a journey. And so they have to be strong enough to make it. And so that's really what I want to, you know, kind of dedicate the rest of my life to uh, um, being able to do something bigger for them. I, I hope that it works. You know, I hope that it works. <laughs> Where do you see yourself in the next few years? Ooh, um, graduating from graduate school. That, you know, let's put that out in the atmosphere, you know. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'm one year deep. I'm, uh, I just completed my first year. I was able to make the dean's list both semesters and pass my first year review. So my thesis um, question and topic has been officially approved. What I am working on now is the approach by which I will gather the research. So in the next five years, I see myself graduating with this thesis. I see myself doing more talks I guess very similar to the one you and I are having, but on a grander scale with people about diversity in design and with people about black designers. And I see myself doing something in training or education and definitely something entrepreneurial. The one thing that I have learned about, you know, just not being in that corporate environment, that nine to five grind, Maurice, I can't go back. Yeah, I think any entrepreneur, particularly any black entrepreneur, they know that once you get that first taste of working for yourself and being able to sort of set your own rules and set your own hours and things, it's hard to go back. Like, you don't want to go back. Not saying that you should go back, but once you get that little, taste. you know, that little taste of freedom, I don't know, maybe it's a black thing. I don't know. But you get that little taste of freedom. You're not you're not trying to go back. I'm glad to hear that from you because, like I said, I thought maybe it was a design thing. You know what I'm saying? I, I'm glad to hear that other entrepreneurs kind of go through that. I just see that there aren't very many companies doing really what I want to do. And mm -hmm. I have just really decided that I'm not going to be in a situation where some non-creative person some non-creative marketing manager type of person is going to be micromanaging my talent. How dare you? No, no. Mm -hmm. I will use my God given talent to how he sees fit and what he has moved and opened the doors for me to do. That is what I will do. And, and that's really how I see it. So he has been gracious enough to open these doors, which is another reason why I really feel this is where I'm supposed to be. Never in my career has doors opened and moved so quickly <laughs> um, so quickly for me I have to believe this is a higher power moving on my behalf and so that's why I'm going to stick it out this time it, it, you know I might not have my Lexus but a Lexus isn't everything I, I think at night I will sleep a lot better knowing that I help the body of people do something great with their careers and so that's really what I want to do well, just to wrap up this interview, I mean, you've said just so many powerful things. Where can our audience find you online? Oh, wow. Well, I am really getting in love with my Twitter account. Okay. <laughs> and so you can catch me on Twitter at Magenta Prince. I'm always, you know, surfing and looking. I have a Quora account and I'm on Facebook. Um, but I guess you can also just straight email me. I'm, I'm always open to a conversation. My email address is Jacinda, W-L-K-R, at gmail.com. All right. Sounds good. Jacinda Walker, thank you again so much for taking time out of your day for this interview. And, of course, I will actually be seeing you at WC yes. Fest 
very soon. So I'll also get to thank you in person. But <laughs> but no, thank you just so much. I think for the people that are listening, this is there's just been a lot of great information that you've shared. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I'll get you some more people if you like. <laughs> And that's it for this week. Woo, that was a long podcast, wasn't it? Uh, but Jacinda just had so much great information to share that I wanted to make sure that you heard every single word of it. Big thanks to her and thanks to you for listening. Don't forget to thank our sponsors as well, MailChimp and 70KFT. MailChimp reigns supreme when it comes to email marketing and is the service provider of choice for designers and small businesses all over the world. Visit them at MailChimp.com and sign up for a free account. Also, make sure you check out 70KFT as well and thank them for sponsoring this week's episode. They're at 70KFT.com, and you can also like their page on Facebook at Facebook.com forward slash 70KFT. Revision Path is a 318 media project. If you like these interviews and the other content we're providing, they help keep us going strong. Just visit RevisionPath.com forward slash donate and let us know. Leave a tip in our tip jar, sponsor an upcoming episode, or join at the $5 fist bump level and show your ongoing support. Thanks so much again for listening, and we'll see you next time.